Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to another session of the Playhouse. With me, I have got the man, the legend, the myth. <laughs> I've got a leader. I've got an incredible human being. This is going to be a conversation that you are thoroughly going to enjoy. I may not do just the intro, but I'm going to try my best. He is the senior pastor of Mavuno Church. For those of you who know Mavuno Church, I'm not just talking about one branch of the church. Mavuno Church has grown to over 20 churches currently and growing and growing. On top of that, he is the author of over six books, I'd say seven books. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Seven books for seven, <laughs> am I right? <laughs> seven books. And one of those books has been translated to so many different languages. Yeah. I'm talking about none other than Mizizi. We're going to talk all about this and you're going to hear about so much more. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, put your hands together for Pastor Moravi Wanjao, a.k.a. Pastor M. <laughs> Pastor M, I normally do my own sound effects. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so bear with me. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, thank you so much. Budge budget issues, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> my hands, eh? <laughs> First and foremost, thank you so much for agreeing to be... Um, on this platform, on the Playhouse, wow. agreeing to share your story, yeah. to just um, just have a candid, real, raw conversation. Uh, warning: on this platform, we hold nothing back. We just we keep it real, we keep it's it real. raw. Okay. And uh, because I know you, I will keep it even raw. Bring, bring it on. <laughs> I bring it on. Eh? <laughs> so let's jump straight into it. Eh? Yeah. The first question that I normally like asking people on the Playhouse is just to take me way back to paint to paint a picture of your upbringing. Yeah. 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 Um, or were you born a pastor? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm actually second born of four kids. Grew up in Langata, um, Moy Estate. Um, and uh, folks, dad worked for the government, mom worked for KCC, the milk company. Mm -hmm. And so really working class uh, family. Uh, fa one of the first, fam I mean Langata, Moy Estate was one of the first estates in Langata. So all this stuff that you see in Langata nowadays, um, gay, all that was just forest. Nice. What and, year are we talking about by there? Uh, this, I was born 1970, so I'm turning 50 next year. Mm. You're so, turning 50? You haven't yet turned 50 yet? No, 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 no. Yeah, no, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So, uh, are you calling me old? No, no, I'm saying okay, huge accomplishment. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, You've so, done a lot. Uh, so, grew up, yeah, so grew up there. Um, older sister and two brothers and then uh, younger sister, so two and two. Um, grew up, I went to Langata West Primary School, which was uh, the neighborhood school, um, and was really a Langata kid. Went to St. Barnabas Church, which is where my parents went, the Anglicans. Um, and uh, I mean, estate life those days was amazing. I mean, we lived next to a forest, literally. Mm -hmm. Next to the estate was a forest that went all the way till Bomas of Kenya. And so we grew up waking up. You were up. part of the park. Like for real, <laughs> it was really the park. I mean, literally, those ones where the national park would release a warning, a leopard has, re has escaped, so stay out of the forest kind of story. Eh? It was a proper forest, not like what you see today. Yeah. Uh, which talks badly about what we've done to our forest today. Uh, the whole of this, all these estates there were just all forest. Mm -hmm. So I mean, we'd wake up. It was an ideal childhood because I mean, we'd go to school, come back, 3.30, you're home. Uh, stay out playing uh, on the streets with the estate kids. Uh, we used to do every every April, we used to do something called Safari Rally, which mm -hmm. was you make cars with tin mabati, and then we, I mean, it was so well organized. And we'd have 50 kids uh, driving those little cars. We had a checkoff point, drive all through <laughs> the forest, uh, and there'd always be a winner. I mean, it was incredible. Um, and we had dogs, so we'd walk our dogs into the forest. Mm -hmm. Like in the holidays, I mean, those days, kids grew up like weeds. Parents never really, uh, they'd go to work, yeah? So they, they don't even know where you went. And I can tell you, we'd leave home like at eight in the morning and come back at six at night. And you've, done, you've climbed trees, you've swum in ponds in the river, in the, I mean, rivers in the forest, uh, caught fish, fried them in the, <laughs> on tins of blue band. I mean, it was, it was quite an upbringing. I really enjoyed my upbringing. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Okay, so at this time, um, spiritually in, in your environment, yeah. uh, um, are you saved? No, what, I mean, my what? folks My folks are church people. I mean, grew up church. I grew up going to church with them. Um, and I mean, they were the real deal. It okay. was, you know, there's like the people you hear who talk about their folks who went to church, but then at home they were different. I mean, my folks were the real deal. I mean, they had an incredible faith. I really respected it. 
I went to church as long as I could, but at some point I just felt this isn't relevant for me. Mm -hmm. And I remember just at about when I was 13 and I went to Nairobi school, I went to Parch. And at that point, it just became clear to me that Mazi, the faith I grew up with couldn't keep up with where I was. Couldn't answer the questions I was asking. So I walked, I stopped going to church. Uh, mm -hmm. My folks wisely didn't force me. I mean, they could just tell this guy was going through a, pros a problem, uh, an, an issue. Mm -hmm. And they released me to, to struggle, you know. To figure out face, yourself. To figure out myself. So I went to Patch, completely walked away from church. In fact, far away from church. Um, and throughout high school, in fact, I joined, I mean, I think I was, I was a troublemaker in high school. Uh, I was one of those kids by Form 2 who were sneaking out of school to go partying. Um, those days, carnival was like the big deal. So everybody would just be, we'd be sneaking out of school to go to girls' schools at night. This, we're, we're talking 80s now. This is in the 80s, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, um, so yeah, so, I mean, I was really a troublemaker, but also discovered sports and uh, really thrived in sports. I did a lot of sports. And then I also was just one of those kids who, by, by God's grace, sheer grace, I was, I was really good academically. And so I didn't have to work hard. I was one of those kids that you hate, you know. I didn't have to work hard. I, could, I, could, I played around, but I got A's. So, I mean, I was able to hide my tracks. I was able to sort of, so long as, and with my folks, so long as you brought home a good report card, there was, there was no issues. Yeah. Uh, but I was drinking by Form 3, smoking, doing the whole thing. I mean, it was just, we were with, with, with just a crowd of guys that were doing all this uh, crazy lifestyle. Uh, played for the school team from Form 3. Rugby now. Rugby. Mm -hmm. Actually played rugby, hockey, soccer. Um, like I said, I was good in sports. So I played in many school teams. And that gave you, in part, that gave you permission. Cool I mean, if, Ah, complete. <laughs> <laughs> well, once you hit the rugby team, you, you could do, you could, there's nothing you could do wrong. And so I think that gave me a lot of leeway to just be the bad guy, you know? And uh, enjoyed the notoriety of, of just, you know, we'd, we'd go to our friends' houses. I mean, my folks didn't drink, so there's nothing to, to steal from our house. But we'd go to our friends' homes, homes, raid their dad's whiskey cabinets when they're not home, you know, and then just go out to party. I mean, it was, we, we lived a real dual life. Like yeah. Nobody looking in could tell the kind of life we were living. So that was me in high school. Uh, by God's grace, I mean, got top of my school. Uh, you were top of your school. <laughs> despite all that. <laughs> you got despite all that mess. Huh? And I feel like... But I, I think what happened is I had, a, I had an interesting experience in Form 4. Um, and I, I basically stole my dad's car. And I, I mean, we had been stealing cars since. But I mean, stole my dad's car. I was trying to impress this girl who was at home. My dad had a VW Beetle. It was his like precious possession. Mm. Uh, it's like the, <laughs> his first car. It's like, Don't touch this. And I remember he had just got a pickup to get stuff for the cows because we had moved to Ngong now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had cows. So, we, so he and mom went in the pickup so they could bring food home for the cows. So they left their nice VW, polished, buffed. <laughs> and then this kachiko happened to be around. So I was like, ah, you know, a chance to impress. She lived in Karen. So I remember stealing the car. I mean, I knew where he took his keys, stole the car, put her in, drove her. I was driving her off to Karen. I was driving her home. Um, of course, you're, you're doing the one, one hand thing, you're giving her the story, you know. Of course, I was driving too fast, um, hit, hit an embankment on the side of the road, and the car rolled over 100 meters. Ooh. Like, I mean, it was like a movie. For real, slow motion is not in movies, Ooh. it's in real life. Like, <laughs> and all I remember is just the noise of the breaking glass, the car, the metal crunching. And I just thought, I'm dead. You know, you just feel, this, this is it. I mean, I was like, life is so short, I'm dead. And it's like, the thing rolled and rolled forever. Literally 100 meters, that's how fast we were moving. Huh? And then finally it came to a stop on all fours, which again, it's like, how does that happen? <laughs> and then I, I sort of was just smelling dust, there's glass all over even in my mouth. And I just op I pushed open the door and I got out. And then I looked and I was okay. Like I was perfectly fine. Um, I went to the other door, opened for the chick. She came out, she was perfectly fine. The car, on the other hand, was a complete wreck. Uh, by coincidence, I don't know whether God just had his hand on me even when I was doing my own things. Um, her driver, they were a wealthy family, so they had a driver. And the driver was the first girl on the scene. He was, in, he was shopping somewhere. He had no mobiles at this time, See? no nothing. <laughs> so, so the guy shows up 
And we, he was a cool guy. So I was like, guy, take this chick home. Don't tell anyone what you've seen. So she was taken home. And that was it. So I was left there alone. And long story short, I mean, I think um, I, I, I was so frazzled. I, I just took a matter to home. Um, in fact, it was such shock. It had a carrier, you know, those cool carriers. Yeah. Huh? So I, it was the only thing that I could take. So I just took my, the carrier, uh, flagged the matatu, <laughs> entered, I didn't even have bus fare. And uh, then a few minutes later, I look out the window, I'm going towards town, I'm going the wrong direction. So I stopped the guy, he didn't even charge me, he just, this guy, he, I come out, cross the road, uh, stop another matatu in the other direction, I enter, I just sit, holding my carrier. Uh, it was just a horrible story. Nobody in the Matatu spoke. Eh? Guys were like, hey, hey, hey. You know, you can see glass in the yeah. guys. <laughs> so I got home. Uh, I remember coming out. In fact, at some point I thought, I'm in such trouble with my dad. Eh? I'm dead. So at one point I actually thought, I should just commit suicide now and just finish this story. You know? So I was actually contemplating. The guy in the Matatu, he saw me. I think he could see. Mm. And I can't, that guy must have been an angel, the conductor, because he told me, Kijana, it's okay. <laughs> so I reached my bus stop, he told me to talk to him. In fact, he didn't charge me. <laughs> I went home, I, I swatched. And um, meanwhile, my dad now, people are calling him because people would see the car, they know his car. Mm. Guys are calling him when they get to the office because of course no mobiles. Uh, your son must be dead. Things are so crazy. Um, my dad is now like, whoever has that car, it could only be my son. Eh? So now they start calling hospitals, they start calling morgues. Uh, nobody has seen me. So finally, one of my uncles, he called my uncle who didn't live too far. So the guy came home, um, looked around. They didn't even, nobody had even known I'd come in. And they finally found me sleeping in my bed. The guy took me to hospital. And it was such an interesting experience because I reached Hossi and my folks just reached. And I was like, oh God, no. Yeah, I'm over. <laughs> Fortunately, the doctor's door open. So I go in for checkup. The guy is checking me, I'm sure. I mean, I'm, I'm waiting for him to say this massive internal hemorrhage and whatever, whatever. The guy says, ah, this Kijana is fine, he can go home. I'm like, dude, no! <laughs> I'm going to... I don't want to go home, man. <laughs> I'll be back in a few hours. Yeah. <laughs> so, Fixed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so now you can imagine now the, the, the scene. Now here's a climax of this story. So it's a pickup. Dad, mom, me. <laughs> now you can't even hide, but you're squeezed in the front. Eh? It's, a, it's not a seat for three guys. So I'm sitting at the window, I'm trying to be as far as I can from them. Eh? And I'm just thinking, and it's quiet. You leave, you leave Hossi, you're just driving, no one's talking. I'm like, oh God, I have to break the silence. What do I say? What do I say? So finally, I come up with this speech in my head. I'm like, Dad, I'm so sorry. I've messed your car. Uh, I know it's precious to you. I promise you when I get a job, I'll get your car. That's what I could say. That's, that's the first thing that came out. I'll buy your car one day. I remember, I'm just informed for that point. And my dad, I mean, I'll never forget what he said, because he just looked at me and said, dude, we thought you were dead, Bana. Uh, what's a car? Is, I mean, you're my son, you're alive. Forget the car, we'll get another car another day. I mean, I, it's not like he was richer. So for me, that was such a huge thing, because he was like, you're alive, that's what matters. In fact, he said, I think I need to get you driving lessons. And that story died there, you know? Um, I think that was what started my journey back to God because I don't think I'd ever experienced forgiveness. I mean, it's like, I'm a wreck. I've messed your life. And you, you actually, if you thoop me right now, actually, if you beat me up, you des I deserve it. In mm -hmm. fact, I'll just lie down and say, kill, <laughs> you know. Finish Finish him. me, you know. <laughs> and for him to just say, I forgive you, and that's it. I think just began a journey for me that ended up with me giving my life to Christ, maybe in another six months after that, yeah, so. So it's a dramatic, it's a bit of a dramatic yeah. story. I, I did end up buying him a car one day, like when I was much older. You did, eh? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that, remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like I said, my parents were the genuine thing. And I think that was part of the journey that, no, that now led me back to, start walking back towards God. So by the time you were receiving Christ, had you already finished from form? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. So it was in that gap period. So, so this, this story happens at the beginning of form form. Mm -hmm. So I didn't immediately. Yeah. But it began sort of like an openness. So, yes. So after Form 4, I mean, I still continued with my lifestyle. I mean, I didn't stop. But yeah. I mean, I think there was like a thing that had been planted. Um, I stopped drinking just by myself. I mean, I think I, was, I remember one day coming from Mahanye and I was sitting in a bus. Um, I'd left my buddies there. They were too drunk to come back. So I was the only guy in the bus. I was holding a bottle of, of 
I think it was Campari. I was just, I was, I was just nursing like a bottle, like a brown thing. <laughs> I just looked at myself. I said, "This is wrong." I mean, what am I doing in form four like this? It's just wrong. I mean, I don't know why. All of a sudden, I looked at myself from the outside. I was like, "This is too pitiful." By the way, I left that bottle in the bus. Never drank again. Uh, nobody told me to stop drinking. It was just like I don't want that to be my lifestyle. But I remember my my mom uh, wanted me to go to a camp uh, after form four. You know those ones of this boy. How do I? How do we help him? Mm. So she hooked me up with a word of life, um, and they usually there was a camp called Word of Life, and they used to mm. have a camp site in Mombasa. Yeah, Diani. So she's like, yeah, you can go to Diani. There'll be a camp. Good, good people. I was like, Christian camp Z. Then I can't remember who told me, hey, by the way, there's some really pretty girls who come for that camp. So I was like, hmm. <laughs> Stay home, be bored, <laughs> go for camp, pretty girls. So I was like, okay, so I'll, I'll go for camp. So I went to camp, and um, while I was in camp, it was it was a very interesting experience. I'd never experienced anything like that, because remember, I, I grew up and my my parents' church, Anglican church, pretty traditional. I mean, good good folks, but not contemporary at all. Mm. Then I go to this camp, and I mean, they're playing sports. It's cool people. They're doing music, and I mean, it was my world. It's mm. like people speaking my language for the first time. Eh? Yeah. And I remember just being a bit com- confused. I'm like, hey, these guys are they're cooler than even the people I know, Bana. And these guys are all saved. You know, it was it was a very weird thing. You know, people like Peter Dera. Mm. I mean, those are the guys now I met there. Those were the first time I met. Those guys became such good friends. Peter Goyo Dera. Some of some of those guys became such good friends after yeah. that. So I remember just being amazed. I was like, wow. I mean, I didn't believe, I didn't know that you could actually be saved and be a fun person. Um, and then there was one guy who came for that camp. He was called Joe. Joe, he's one of those guys who, even if you're a bad guy in school, there are those guys who are now the devil. You know, <laughs> like Joe was, like, the, you know, the dealer. Yes. You know, that guy who, who supplies, I mean, he was a, he was a yeah, bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> Which something tells me you're like that. Huh? <laughs> yeah. I mean, this guy was a bad boy. Huh? I mean, like really bad boy. Huh? And even among those, you know, those guys where even bad guys go like, <laughs> <laughs> like you know what? Yeah. I guess you don't even you don't even hear your sister. Eh? Yes. I mean, Joe was just that kind of guy. So the guy came for camp. So I remember as, and this is a weird thing about just be, how hypocritical life is. Like I was looking at him and thinking, what's this guy doing in camp? <laughs> this is a Christian camp. This guy has no business. I mean, I'm the one judging yes. him, huh? uh, which is the weirdest thing. So. I remember just thinking, hey, these guys have no idea who they just let in. This is like a wolf in a, <laughs> in a chicken pen. Eh? Yeah. He's just here for girls. And that's now, that was me, but I'm like, this guy is just here for girls. <laughs> so, like on Wednesday night, because this thing started like Sunday night. Wednesday night, um, there was a, a guy preached and then asked who would like to give their life to Jesus. And Joe stood up. Yo. And guys cheered. Me, I was angry. I was like, these guys have no idea what they've just done, man. This guy has no business getting saved. I mean, these guys are being conned. This guy is a horrible guy. Like, I was angry, like, how foolish these yes. guys were. Yeah. <laughs> like, this preacher, how can if you accept he was a guy? real preacher, he would, he would know that this guy is a thug, yeah? So I remember just being perplexed. I couldn't sleep that night. I was actually angry. Uh, the next morning, in fact, I spoke to my camp, the, the counselor, because they had counselors in the camp, and I just told the guy, dude, uh, Z. Joe, you, you guys, you guys are Z, man. <laughs> There's a limit, man. <laughs> So I remember just, and anyway, I can't even remember what he told me, but I just remember being so perplexed. That day, I don't even think I enjoyed myself. I was like, Z, there's a problem. There has to be a limit. I mean, not everyone should go to heaven, man. <laughs> you can, I mean, this is like Osama, man. You can't do that. <laughs> so I remember that mm-hmm. night, Thursday night, I was in a, in a I, was, I sat in the same meeting. And a preacher, he's called Matthew Smaller. He's a really cool guy. He's a, he's a pastor still until today. We're good friends. And he stood up. I'd never met him before, but he, he's the one who preached that day. I can't remember what he preached, because me, I was still thinking. I was still processing. Huh? And then he said, if anyone would like to give their life to Christ, uh, here's your opportunity. Now, the night before, and Joe had done it, other guys had done it. Huh? So now, I don't know what happened. It was not premeditated. I hadn't thought about it. I just found myself standing and walking to the front. Like, mm. I was even shocked at myself doing that. And, of course, as I'm walking, I'm thinking, guys are following. Whether that day I'm the only guy. <laughs> like I stood in front like everybody could see. It was such a public thing. I remember even, I think I cried. It was just like weird. Huh? But I remember at that point just feeling, okay, this is it. Mm. Uh, there's no turning back from here. It's too public. Everybody knows. And one thing about me is like, if I'm in, I'm in. Mm. So I was like, done. 
I'm completely into this thing. So I decided I'm going to give my life to Jesus under new management. Um, my buddies, at meanwhile, because we had finished high school, so it was like we had planned like a series of hangers. Mm, mm. So me, I just told them, pause a bit, go to coast, I'll be back. So, of course, now I'm just thinking, okay, that, that plan isn't going to work. By the way, nobody's telling me these things. Mm. I just know it's not going to work. Uh, I was dating uh, Kagal, that same girl of the car. I was like, uh, now this chick and the things we do can't work. So <laughs> yes. this story has to finish quickly. So it, as soon as I got back to Nairobi, I was like, I'm going to, so I called my buddies, guys, me, I'm saved. Um, I, I'll just put it out there. So guys already know it's new terms huh, of engagement. And I remember my guys laughed. So like, ah, give yourself a few weeks. This is brainwashing stuff, you know. So they're like, three days, you will be back. <laughs> Of course, three days turned into three weeks. Three, three years. years. Yeah. Exactly. Now it's maybe 30 years now. And um, But what was interesting when I went to meet, to meet this girl, because I was like, it's a breakup. So I called her, had a date. Uh, I mean, that day was just very weird. Because I prayed. I was like, God, I don't know how to break up. You know, this is wrong. I mean, I even feel bad doing it. Huh? Mm. But I felt in my, like, I just knew. As a very new Christian, nobody told me, like, this relationship can't, it's not going to help you in your faith. This is just after you've come back from Costo. Yeah, straight after Costo. Like nobody even told me, at now you're a Christian, you have to do this. Yeah. It's like God instantly just began to tell me things. And I was like, I know I can't do this. If I want to continue with this relationship, I began. There are some things in my life that just have to stop. And it wasn't even so much I want to stop them. It's like, I know they have to stop. Mm. So I remember calling the girl, we sat down. So I told her, I've got something to tell you. Um, and she told me, I also have something to tell you. So I was like, oh. Very interesting. Okay, you go first. Because <laughs> I knew mine was good to be terminal. Huh? <laughs> so, <laughs> so she's like, uh, now, on the, on the time, as you're away in camp, eh, and for a meeting, eh, and I gave my life to Christ. So ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. this relationship of ours has to end. I mean, that's she, came, she was coming to tell me that. So I was like, uh, now you won't believe what I'm about. <laughs> and for sure she didn't believe. She thought I was making it up. Eh? Like, I like, like the next day, you got saved on Wednesday. The next day I got saved. So... I mean, it was just a weird, but I think for me, that was my first miracle. Yeah. That's the first time I was like, hey, okay, God exists. You know, God actually does things that are shocking that you can't mm. explain. Because that was a miracle. I mean, yeah, how do you, I mean, how, like, do you yeah. how do you crazy people? <laughs> and by the way, that mama, she ended up becoming, uh, she ended up becoming a church. She, she, she works for a church somewhere. Mm. <laughs> like, long story. I mean, we're not even in contact anymore. Mm. But I know that she actually ended, ended up going into the church. So it was very weird. Two very wild, very unconnected people. I mean, very, very crazy people. And then in two very unrelated, she's in Nairobi, I'm in Mombasa. That was my first experience of many mm. that began to show me that actually God exists and he's real. Okay, let me ask you. At this time, um, you obviously, pastor was not in your radar of what you wanted to be. No, so not at all. Where, where were you leaning or, did, or, or you didn't know in terms of career, in terms of next stage so my plan was to be rich <laughs> <laughs> that was my career plan 